Today we're going to begin our look at chapter 6, The Progressives. Our learning objective for the first section is to summarize the progressives' goals and how they sought to achieve those goals. So first, we have to answer the question, what was progressivism? In the late 1800s, a reform movement known as progressivism arose to address many of the social problems created by industrialization. The progressives set out to do three things. One, to improve the living conditions of the urban poor. Two, to challenge the power and the practices of big business. Three, to call for the government to be more honest and responsive to the people's needs. Now, drawing a lot of attention to these issues were a group of journalists that become known as muckrakers. Uh, they exposed the problems in society. And so, if, you know, to think of the imagery associated with this, uh, if you think of muck, when I think of muck, I, I think of uh, what you might find in the gutter, the dirt and debris and, and whatever uh, types of filth you find in, along the gutter. Um, you know, and if you think of raking that up, this is in a sense kind of what these journalists do. They look at the problems uh, or the ugly side of society and they draw attention to it by kind of bringing this to the surface and they do so through their writing. Uh, a couple of examples, or a couple of the leading muckrakers of the time period were Ida Tarbell, who wrote a scathing report on Standard Oil, uh, really revealing the, um, the very harsh uh, business and ruthless business practices of John D. Rockefeller and Standard Oil, and how they really tried to monopolize the oil industry. And then also Upton Sinclair, who Upton Sinclair wrote a very well-known book called The Jungle, in which he documented the unsanitary conditions uh, of the meatpacking industry. And here is an excerpt from The Jungle. The meat would be shoveled into carts, and the man who did the shoveling would not trouble to lift out a rat, even if he saw one. There were things that went into the sausage, in comparison with which a poison rat was a tidbit. There was no place for the men to wash their hands before they ate their dinner. So they made a practice of washing them in the water that was to be ladled into the sausage. There would be butt ends of smoked meat and the scraps of corned beef and all odds and ends of the waste of the plants that would be dumped into the old barrels in the cellar and left there. Under the system of rigid economy which the packers enforced, there were some jobs that it only paid to do once in a long time, and among those was the cleaning out of the waste barrels. Every spring they did it, and in the barrels would be dirt, rust, and old nails, and stale water, and cartload after cartload of it would be taken up and dumped into the hoppers with the fresh meat and sent out to the public's breakfast." Unquote. So, you know, through uh, the writings of these muckrakers. They drew attention to these major problems, making many aware Americans aware of problems that they previously were not aware existed. Uh, another major problem, as we mentioned, that muckrakers sought to address were the plight of the urban poor. There were also photographers who documented the urban poor. And once again, you know, the saying is, uh, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. Uh, particularly Jacob Rees was well known for uh, his work taking pictures of the of those that uh, were struggling, the poor, the particularly poor immigrants in the urban cities and drawing attention to their plight. And this helps to lead to the New York State Tenement House Act. Uh, progressives made progress on housing reforms in New York with the passage of the New York State Tenement House Act in 1901. The law required landlords to install lighting in public hallways and to provide at least one toilet for every two families. Now, if you think about that for a minute, you know, most of us probably live in homes where we have multiple bathrooms uh, just, you know, for one family. And, uh, you know, most houses, I mean, there, there are some houses that only have one, uh, but there are a lot of ha houses, especially three bedrooms and larger, tend to have two to three bathrooms, and, you know, that's, that's gotten to be commonplace. 
but you know, here they've passed a law requiring at least one bathroom for every two families. Uh, so you know, imagine not not only having not having or not only having to share a bathroom with your family, but having to share a bathroom with somebody else's family. And remember, this this law represents an improvement over the old system. Uh, and of course, typically what tended to happen is that actually notice we said a toilet for every two families, not bathroom, but a toilet for every two families. And um, you know, typically at this point in time, many homes or many tenement buildings didn't have running water and so they were reliant upon outhouses. And if you don't know what an outhouse is, uh, an outhouse is, is really very similar to a modern day porta potty, only they typically didn't have the chemicals in them and it was really nothing more than a hole in the ground, basically in a little wooden shack that had a, a hole cut out for a seat. So very unpleasant conditions, and, and that's what people had to live with uh, in many places. And eventually outhouses were banned in New York City slums. The housing reforms improved the living conditions and the death rate dropped dramatically within 15 years. Uh, another thing that the, some progressives sought was to fight racial discrimination. W.E.B. Du Bois and others formed the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, to fight racial discrimination. Uh, one of the things also that they really campaigned for was something we talked about in the last unit. They really began to push hard for anti-lynching laws to put an end to this, this practice where uh, most frequently the targets of lynching were African Americans, particularly in the South, although it also happened elsewhere, uh, where African Americans would be accused of something and without given a trial would simply be hung by a lynch mob and this was not illegal. So uh, these anti-lynching laws were designed to put an end to that practice. Um, the NAACP also fought segregation and they protested D.W. Griffith's movie, The Birth of a Nation which portrayed African Americans negatively and portrayed Klansmen as heroes. And this is a movie we're going to talk about uh, time and time again here in the next uh, few chapters. Uh, President Wilson screened the movie in, in the White House and afterwards said that it was like writing history with lightning. I'm not quite certain exactly what that means, but uh, sounded like a pretty good review uh, which gave some credibility to the movie. The movie was noted for, uh, at the time, using you know, kind of groundbreaking techniques that, that helped to really modernize the movie industry. Uh, but once again, at the same time, it was considered to be a movie that depicted African Americans uh, negatively and at the same time portrayed Klansmen as heroes. So uh, it's under understandable why, while why groups, including the NAACP, uh, you know, sought to ban the movie. Uh, another group fighting racial discrimination uh, was led by Sigmund Livingston, who founded the, the uh, Anti-Defamation League to fight anti-Semitism or prejudice against Jews. Other progressives fought to put an end to child labor. Women and children often worked long hours for low pay and very hazardous conditions, much like you know, many male-oriented jobs as well of the time period. Uh, many of these jobs, workers work 12 to 16 hours a day, oftentimes working in, in very uh, inhospitable conditions where people will become very tired and drained and might become sloppy uh, using equipment that didn't have any particular safety guards on them and if somebody was wounded, they, they didn't have workman's comp. They, if they were unable to work, they could simply be replaced. And children oftentimes face that same type of difficulty as well. Florence Kelly pushed for reforms, getting child labor banned in Illinois and limiting the hours that women and children could be forced to work. Businesses began to fight reform in the courts. Early decisions sided with business leaders, but in 1908, the court sided with workers in the case of Mueller versus Oregon. The court upheld a 10-hour workday for women based on evidence that long hours were harmful to women's health. This paved the way for, for uh, limits 
to the length of the workday for men as well. And then another thing that really helped to gain support for organized labor, in particular women in the workforce and uh, better safety standards, was a tragedy that took place in New York. Uh, on March 25th, 1911, a fire broke out in the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. And uh, mostly there were young women that worked there, many of them immigrants. Um, they believed that the fire most likely started when somebody either tossed a, a match or, uh, or a, a lit cigarette into a scrap bin. Probably not on purpose, but probably more, uh, you know, unaware that uh, maybe thinking they were throwing it into a garbage can. Uh, but ultimately, a lot of the scrap material that was left laying around really became a fuel source. And the whole thing went up very quickly. Now, they also had locked some of the doors to prevent people, basically to prevent theft. And so, uh, as a result, it leaves many of these workers vulnerable. Uh, when they find out the fire has, has broken out, uh, many people are having, a, having difficulty trying to escape the building and uh, you know, this really creates mass chaos. Also, the doors were designed to open inward, which in, in a time of a fire proves to be a problem because people, panicked people, rush the door and are pressing forward. The people at the door can't pull the door open because they're being pushed into the door by people further back that are panicked. Um, you know, so all of these things really hindered the ability to try to get people out. Many people perished. Uh, when the fire department got there, their ladders wouldn't reach all the way to the top floor. Uh, some people jumped to their deaths. So, you know, ultimately, the whole incident uh, becomes rather shocking. And, and it really gets people's attention as people began to realize that, you know, workers are left very vulnerable. Uh, all in all, 146 people died in the fire, most of them women, some as young as 14. And the owners of the factory were put on trial but were acquitted of all charges. And they were also carrying more insurance than, than uh, really was necessary and actually turned a healthy, a healthy profit from the fire. But the tragedy won support uh, for efforts to, to change labor laws. Now we also will talk about unions along with this, this effort to improve the uh, working conditions of the urban poor, unions play a vital role. In 1900, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, or the ILGWU, was founded as a union for unskilled female garment workers. In 1909, they called a general strike called the Uprising of 20,000. They won a shorter work week and added thousands of new members. The American Federation of Labor, or AFL, allowed only skilled workers, and it grew into one of the largest unions in the United States. The industrial workers of the world, known as the Wobblies, uh, included workers that were left out of the AFL. Their tactics were more radical, including industrial sabotage. Uh, the government eventually cracked down on them because of their radical views and actions. There were also numerous efforts to try to reform government. Uh, one of the leading progressive politicians was Robert M. LaFollette. Uh, he was a progressive politician in Wisconsin who pushed for the regulation of railroads and utilities as well as for the direct primary. The 17th Amendment provided for the direct election of senators. Now, originally in the Constitution, senators were elected. Remember, each state has two senators but the state senators would be elected by the state legislature of each state. So thus, the senators were really only held accountable to the, to the state legislature, and the state of legislature was held accountable to voters. Uh, but it, it really wasn't very direct. And so this idea uh, of, of having the direct election of senators, where the actual voters of a state vote for their own senators, makes the senators more accountable directly to the people. Other progressive era reforms included the initiative, 
allowing voters to place a proposed law on the ballot for public approval. This is something that we have here in California. If you look at, you know, when it's election time here in California, oftentimes there are numerous initiatives on the ballot, which are proposed laws that can be voted on. The referendum, uh, that allows the public to either approve or veto a law by public vote. Also, many laws get put before the voters this way. And then something else we have here in California as well is called the recall, which is another progressive era reform. And this allows voters to remove a public official by a special election. And for example, here in California, uh, only about a decade ago, we removed a governor, uh, Gray Davis, who had just been reelected when news broke that uh, basically the California economy was really in bad shape, or not so much the economy at that point in time, but the, uh, the state of California was in bad economic condition. And that was something that he was aware of and had kind of hid that information during the election. So a recall campaign was mounted. And then at that point in time, we voted in a recall. Uh, one, we had to vote on whether or not we were going to recall uh, Governor Davis. And then if the recall passed, we also had to vote on who his replacement would be. And at that particular point in time, the Democratic nominee to replace Gray Davis who was a Democrat, was Cruz Bustamante. And the Republican candidate was Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, of course, of movie fame. Schwarzenegger won that, that uh, special election, and the recall did pass. That's how uh, Schwarzenegger became the California governor. That's, that's what first brought him into the governorship. Then he subsequently won uh, a re-election bid.